Chapter 12 A few days later, my job cleaning the ghetto ended and I was put back to work in Plazao. Without Uncle Moshi, there was no one to help me get a job outside the camp again. The work was brutal and the food too meager to sustain me. Some mornings I could barely get myself up and out of my bunk and I had a hard time standing at roll call. Was this how it happened? Was this how a prisoner slipped from being a person to a musal manor? One night, after a hard day's work digging trenches for new latrines, I collapsed out to the floor of my barracks. I didn't have the strength to climb into my bunk. I was desperate to get a couldn't make my legs obey me, couldn't pull my own weight with my thick and straw arms. But if I didn't get up soon, the capo would come through and would beat me for not being in my bunk. No one bent to help me in my struggle to stand. Everyone else was like me, barely had enough energy to spare for themselves, let alone anyone else. Be no one, care for no one. That's how you survive. That's what Uncle Moshi taught me. Moshi, I thought, my chest aching. Why aren't you here? Why did you have to die? I need help. I need a friend. I needed Moshi. He would have helped me back up despite his wa warning not to care. Who would help me now? I rolled myself onto my chest to push myself up, but the board beneath me was loose. Wait, a loose board? I knew the cable would come in and now, but lying there on the floor and staring right at the board made me remember building the new barracks across camp when I first arrived. There was always a space, a small one, between the wood floor and the dirt below. If this board was loose enough... The board pulled loose from the floor in my shaking hands. I glanced around to see if anyone had noticed, but of course no one had. The other prisoners were doing whatever they could to ignore me, just like I ignored them. The gap in the boards would be wide enough for me to slip down inside into the space between the floor and the ground. I was tempted to pull the board all the way up and roll down inside and disappear, but my absence from my bunk would be noticed. And what would I do? Hide down there forever? I would be dead even quicker without what little bread and soup they gave us. But tomorrow, tomorrow after roll call, I could disappear into the barracks instead of showing up for my job. People were reassigned all the time. No one would know that I was gone. I could sneak back and hide under the floor. It was like Moshi was helping me, even though he wasn't there. He had shown me the board. As I pushed myself up off the floor with every gram of strength I had left, I felt Moshi's hand helping me up. I reached out and grabbed hold of my bunk, clawing my way into my bed. I was not a musal man. Not yet. The next morning after roll call, I grabbed the two boys I knew in my barrack, Thomas and Isaac, and showed them the board. I don't know why I showed them. Not when you survive by looking out for yourself and only yourself. Maybe because it was I'd wanted someone to help me when I had needed it. Maybe it was just that I would be lonely in there all day. But maybe it was that I just couldn't keep a secret from someone else who could use help too. I'd done that with the black market food Moshe had brought for us, and I had felt guilty. I didn't want to hide out underneath the floor alone while everyone else was worked to death. We can't, Thomas said immediately. If we're caught, we'd be killed. We'll die if we don't hide in here, I told him. Do you want to go back out there and be worked to death? Or worse, killed by Goth? No, but this is begging for punishment. This is survival, I told them. I pulled up the board the rest of the way. There's room inside for all three of us. Isaac crawled down inside and Thomas finally gave in. At first, all we did was sleep. We had been worked so hard and fed so little, all our bodies wanted to do was hibernate, like bears. The ground was hard, but it didn't matter. We were So were the wooden pallets we called beds. We slept, only waking long enough to poke one another if we snored. The sound of footsteps on the floor above woke us, and we knew it was time to come out for roll call. We couldn't miss a roll call or they would come looking for us. As prisoners, we began to come back into the barracks. We pushed our way out, hurriedly replacing the floorboard and sitting down on my bunk like we'd just come back from work. Nobody ever suspected, or if they did, they didn't say anything. Talking got you killed. The more we hid under the floor, the stronger we got. We weren't healthy, not by a long shot, but without the heavy labor of the day, our bodies recovered a little. I didn't have any more trouble climbing back into my bunk each night, and Thomas, Isaac, and I started to sleep less during the day, staying awake to whisper with one another. We talked about food mostly, but also our homes and our families until it hurt too much to remember. Then we'd roll over and sleep again, always listening for the soft step of prisoners' feet on the floor above us to let us know when to come out. But one day it wasn't footsteps we heard, it was voices, and in the middle of the day. Isaac slithered over to look out of the cracks in the crawl space wall. What he saw made him gasp. <gasps> it's Goth, he whispered. Goth and his dogs and two guards. They're heading for our barrack. We're dead. 
Thomas said. Those dogs will smell us right away. They'll find us and we'll be shot. The tight little crawl space under the floorboard suddenly felt like a coffin, like I was already dead and buried. My refugee from the nightmare of Plaza was now a trap. It was all I could do not to burst out of it screaming. Yannick, what do we do? Isaac asked, his voice tight with the same desperation I felt. I looked out through the cracks. Goth was coming closer, all shining black leather boots and crisp black uniform. One of his dogs lifted his ears and looked right at me. I pulled back away from the wall. We're trapped. We have to get out of here. We have to get out of here. I was almost choking on my own fear. And go where? Thomas hissed. If we leave, they'll find us in the barrack. I don't care. We can't be caught here. I twisted and squirmed until I was on my back. If I could just lift that board, see the light from the room, breathe in the air. It was so tight down here, so close, closing in. I should grab my hand. Yannick, we can't. We have to. I had to get out of this coffin. We'll, we'll pretend we're on work detail. He'll kill us. God will kill us, Thomas said. Either he'll kill us or he won't, I told him. But I know one thing. If he finds us hiding down here, he'll kill us for sure. I pushed my way up and out of the crawl space. It felt like coming up for air after being underwater. I was free of my little coffin. I gasped, filling my lungs. But if I didn't really want to die, I had to move fast. We all did. I helped Isaac out and then Thomas, and we put the board back quickly and quietly as we could, my heart thumping. But it made me feel alive and made me feel as if I wanted to stay alive. The only way we were going to get out of this was to make Goth believe we were on work detail and he could smell fear as well as his dogs could. Maybe even better. I dragged Isaac and Thomas to the door with me. Come on, I said. I'll do the talking. We left the barrack right as Goth and his dogs turned the corner. You there! Stop! Goth shouted. Where are you, what are you doing? Where are you going? My hands shook as I doffed my cap like we were drilled to do. We were sent to work detail on the south side of camp, sir, I said, my voice breaking and trembling so badly. Goth's dogs, dogs stared at us, panting. Their ears pricked up like they were just waiting for Goth to tell them to attack us. Would they smell my fear? Did the dogs know I was lying? I stood my ground and tried not to shake. It, I was deathly afraid, but everyone was afraid when they met Goth, whether they'd been hiding or not. Goth glared at us for a moment, then walked by without saying another word. Isaac and Thomas and I rooted to the spot, afraid to say or do anything that would make Goth reconsider. When he was a few steps gone, I realized that not moving was the wrong thing, and I grabbed my friends and pulled them along. Let's go, I whispered, and we hurried around the corner. We didn't stop when Goth was out of sight, but I could finally breathe. In trying to survive, I'd come closer than I'd ever been to dying. I would never hide under the floorboards again. Malik's Salt Mine, 1943 to 1944, Chapter 13. One morning at roll call, I was one of 50 prisoners pulled out of the ranks and loaded onto the truck. The Nazis didn't tell us where we were going. They're taking us away to kill us, one of the men said. But that didn't make any sense. Amon Goth had no problem of killing any of us at Plaza. Why bother to load us onto a truck and take us somewhere else to kill us? Just looking around at the other Nazis had chosen, I could tell we were the strongest men at Plaza, or at least the furthest from becoming Musil Manners. We were being, we, I was sure we were being taken somewhere else to work, and I was sure it had to be better than Plaza. My two weeks saving my strength under the floor of the barrack had saved me. The truck pulled up outside a building with a tall spire like a bell tower, and this was no church. The place had an industrial look to it. Oil-covered motors and generators stood around it like sentinels, and train tracks led into it and out. The Nazi in charge of the truck unloaded us, and we joined another group of prisoners who had been brought in from somewhere else. I ended up standing next to a man who looked familiar to me, but I couldn't place him. Are you from Krakow? I asked him. No, he said with surprising force. I am no one. He was right, of course. I shouldn't have asked. But I noticed two of the other men who came with me from Plaza looking at him more intently now. First, we will take you into the mine to show you where you will be working, the capo told us. Then you will be assigned to your barracks. We were marched into the factory, which wasn't a factory after all. It was a sheltered entrance to an enormous mine. In groups of 10 and 12, we boarded elevators. I got on with a familiar looking man and then the two prisoners from Plaza who had been watching him. They stood close behind him now uncomfortably close, but he didn't say anything. He just stared at the floor. The elevator kajumped down and down and down we went. Electric lights on the open elevator cage illuminated the gray white walls of the mine shaft we descended. 
Suddenly, I remembered of being under the floorboards again in Plazo. I was squeezed in, underground, trapped in the dark with the death coming for me. Salt, one of the others whispered. The the Waliksa salt mine. It has to be. My trance was broken. I reached out my hand to touch the wall and tasted my fingers. It was true. The walls were made of salt. The elevator car hit the bottom, and we were guided through the labyrinth of tunnels and small chambers. You'll be working room 47, our capo told us. Level 7. We marched down salt stairs. We crawled along salt floors and passed stalagmites formed from salt water dripping off of the ceiling. I'd never seen anything like it. The mine was a strange dream world. Very soon, we left the electric lights behind and we could only see as far ahead of us as our capo's carbide headlamp. Maybe you're thinking it would be easy to slip away into the tunnels, our capo told us. Maybe you're thinking it would be easy to escape into the darkness. There are nine levels, 300 kilometers of tunnels. Maybe you're thinking we would never find you. The capo stopped and turned his headlamp towards us. You're right. We wouldn't find you. You would be lost forever in a maze blacker than night, with nothing to eat but salt and nothing to drink but salt water. If I were you, I wouldn't get lost, either on purpose or by accident. We all followed closer behind him the rest of the way. The cable showed us the room where we would be working, the picks and shovels we would be using, the carts we would fill with them. The other prisoners who worked the mine were already back in their barracks asleep. We would get up before dawn and come back right here to work without a full night's sleep. Just the thought of it made my arms and legs ache. The capo took us out a very different way, through the vast chamber where every footstep echoed. One of the men in front of me stumbled, and a piece of salt clattered off the wooden boardwalk beneath us and splashed. Water! There was an entire lake under here. It rippled and glimmered, black in the light from the capo's lamp. Up more steps we went, and another elevator, until we came to another huge chamber. This one lit with the electric light again. There was no lake, but something even more med- more amazing. Statues, dozens of figures of statues, all covered out, carved out of salt. And the lights in the ceiling, they were chandeliers, chandeliers made of salt. After so many months and years of dirty streets and peeling paint and gray uniforms and Spartan barracks, it so- was astounding that there could be such beauty in the world, especially here, a mile underground. The workers... The miners, they did this, whispered the man who told me the name of the mine before. Some of these statues are a thousand years old. There were trolls and serpents and gnomes. There were Polish knights and kings and queens. I wish that somehow we could magically come to life and spree us and to save us. They stayed still, though, frozen in salt, as trapped, as helpless as we were. The last room was another monument left by former miners in the Wallazika happier past. It was a temple. A chapel? No, an underground cathedral. There were more statues, an altar, a rail, everything a Catholic needed to hold services. But praying hadn't done the miners any good either. The Nazis almost owned almost all of Poland now, even 300 meters underground. Night had fallen and the stars were out when we got back topside. We were taken to our barracks, which were no better than our last at Plazo. Because we'd missed dinner, we were sent to bed without any food. We knew better than to complain, and most of us went to our beds as quickly as we could. Morning, all as we all knew, would be here before any of us were ready for it. But the two men who'd been looking strangely at the man I thought was familiar cornered him once the capo was gone. Your name is Holtzman, isn't it? One of them said. No, the familiar-looking man said. No, my name is Finkelstein. You were in Krakow, weren't you? The other man said. You were one of the June Rats policemen. Of course, that's why I remembered him. How could I have forgotten that face? He was the man who had brought the Nazis to my flat. The one who had the one who had stolen everything from us while the Nazis took my mother's ring. I remembered my mother's eyes that day, the emptiness that had never completely gone away. I'd been so scared, so protective that I hadn't even felt anger. I did now. No, the policeman said. There was panic in his eyes. My name is Finkelstein from Zilanki. Quiet in there, the cable's voice shouted from outside. The two men said nothing more to the policeman. They watched him all the way back to their bunks. That night, I could hear the man crying softly in his bed until someone hissed at him to shut up. The morning was cold, with only lukewarm coffee-flavored water to fight off the chill. It was colder still underground, where it was always damp and the sun never shone. The low ceiling made us walk all walk like old crones, and I even noticed that even when they could, 
Some of the old timers never stood up straight anymore. as Their backs were permanently bent. I was given my own carbide light, my own pickaxe, and my own place to work. It was heavy work and boring. There was nothing to it but swinging my pickaxe again and again, breaking off big chunks of salt that another prisoner shoveled into a donkey cart. I chipped away, my arms already starting to ache from my weakness and malnutrition, when I heard someone cry out from the chamber around the corner from mine. What's this? How did this happen? Who's done this? It was the voice of one of the capos. It wasn't said in the tone the capos used to taunt us or to have a good time and to work harder. This was something different, something confused, something scared. The other capos heard it in his voice right away and ran around the corner to help. Without guards, we put down our picks and shovels and hurried to peek around the corner behind them. It was the June Rat policeman, Holtzman or Finkelstein or whatever his name was. His head had been smashed in with the shovel and the rest of his body was gashed and torn and bleeding. In the carbide light from a dozen watching headlamps, something glittered and shone in his cuts. Salt. Someone had rubbed salt into all of his wounds. Like Abin Lech in the Book of Judges, who sowed the fields of his own people with salt after he put down their rebellion. I remembered reading about him before while studying the Torah with my father long before the war. This was punishment and purification all in one. I said, I want to know who did this, the capo yelled. I looked around from face to face, trying to see who had done it. The men who had accused him of the, in the barracks weren't there. It could have been any of them. It could have been all of them. No one said anything, and I was worried we would all be whipped for the crime, but the capo only shook his head. What do I care if you kill one another? You'll all be dead soon enough anyhow. You, and you, he said, pointing to two of the prisoners watching nearby. Drag this body out of here, weigh him down, and dump him in the underground lake. No one said another word about him. The capo sent us all back to our places, and I chipped away at the salt wall again until they told me to stop. That night, I dreamed of the salt statues came to life and set our captors with their swords, with every one of the statues, at the faces of a dead man.